Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man from live from Kalalau Lookout on the island of Kauai. Beautiful background there. I took that picture a little while ago, but it's a beautiful, beautiful place. So if you're going to visit Hawaii, go to Kalalau. And if you're going to go to Kauai, that's the wettest place on earth, so check that out too. Kind of applies to today's show. We're talking a little bit about weather today and a little bit about water, mostly water, and some of the magical properties of water. Right before the show, we're actually talking to Jay Fidel, who uh, runs Think Tech here, and we're talking about how people just really underestimate the value of water, not just in a biological sense and what we need for our bodies, but the amazing things that water represents on us, on our planet, the, the, the reality that nothing could exist on this planet without water. That's why when we go to Mars and places like that, we always look for signs of water um, as, a, as a good sign of maybe that's a place we can, we can make things happen. So anyway, today's guest is uh, Dr. Ethan Allen, and uh, he's also a host here on uh, Think Tech Hawaii. And we, we kind of get to get to visit and visit each other's shows from time to time. And I thought it'd be neat to um, talk a little bit more about water than just hydrogen, because that's all I talk about most of the time anyway. <laughs> that's only half of it. And it, it, that's only two atoms out of the right, water. Right. You've got to talk about the other atom once in a while. That's and, right. And, the, and the, the whole molecule together. So welcome, Doc. Appreciate having you here. Oh, great to be here. And, Thanks, um, Let's, yeah, I, you know, one of the things that I noticed was that, um, you know, when, when I was in the military, uh, we really had a lot to do with water. Like, we didn't fly if the ocean was too rough because it'd be too hard to rescue us. Mm -hmm. um, we had to learn to survive in deserts if there wasn't any water. We had to learn how to swim and, and you know, survive and get through the surf and get back to shore. And all those aspects of water are pretty challenging, but there's a lot of really cool things about water and cool things you can learn. And, why don't you talk a little bit about what, what you talk about on your show that has to do with water and the science side of water? Well, yeah, they're, they're, you're quite right. I mean, there's a thousand different ways you can talk about water. But in relation to energy, one of the things I think that people will sort of miss and don't, don't widely understand is how water is so critical for moving all the solar energy on this planet around, mm. basically distributing that energy in a, in a relatively uniform way across the planet. That is the... Solar energy strikes very powerfully, uh, really in the equatorial tropics, right. much of which is ocean, right? It heats up that water a good deal, and that water then basically circulates north and south uh, and carries that heat through the temperate zones into actually the, the polar zones, and is just sort of dumping out that heat all along mm -hmm. the process and really help, helps make this planet much so, more uniform. So would that be what we consider currents? Right, exactly. So as opposed to tides, right. those are the currents. So the Gulf Streams is a classic one that those of us came up, grew up on the East Coast know about, right? It's picking up uh, nutrients and heat, basically, yeah. in, in the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. and swinging around and, and dumping that heat out over Europe, which is why places like France and England are actually as warm as they are, mm -hmm. considering they're actually very far very north. Far north, right? Um, but they're they're getting that heat that's essentially heat that was brought in by the tropics <clears throat> and moved by water up to their region. So um, people don't really, you know, people appreciate, yeah, that you can die from thirst of all life forms need water, but it's less well understood that that water is really moving all the energy around on Earth and really hmm. sort of keeping us cool here by pulling the heat away. Right. And that and that same principle stabilizes temperatures on shore in places like uh, Anchorage in Alaska. Because it's near the ocean, it right. kind of stays real stable temperature-wise, whereas you move inland, Right. Where there's not as much water, it gets really, really, really cold, like Fairbanks. Right. It's super cold down in the minus 40s and minus 60s, where Anchorage will always stay, you know, zero, maybe minus 10 or minus 15. Right. Again, it's related to, to water's great heat capacity. <clears throat> you can see it really vividly in a, in a fun demonstration that I sometimes have done, which is that you take a simple balloon, a plastic balloon, and fill it halfway with water, and you can then set that down on a flame and literally have the flame burning against the balloon. And they just it sit won't there. burn the balloon. No, won't melt the, the, no, it won't. The, oh, I never thought you, of that. You sort of sit there, and it's so counterintuitive that it's very, mm -hmm. very almost disturbing to see it because yeah. you, if you do it with an air balloon, of course, the balloon pops immediately. Right yeah. you know? But with the water, you can sit there and you can literally blacken the surface of the balloon from the, mm -hmm. from the carbon deposits on it. But the water just keeps moving the heat away, moving the heat away fast enough that the balloon skin never heats up to a melting point. And so those those currents that keep moving the ocean around. 
do a lot of things in terms of climate, right? In terms of stabilizing temperatures and and it's distributing heat uh, heat energy around the earth. Exactly. And then with those movements also come the nutrients that are in the ocean move around. Exactly. The deep water nutrients come up. The fish eat off of that, so it starts to drive fish cycles, fish life cycles. The fish like to hang out in certain temperature zones. Mm -hmm. You know, all fishermen look at those satellite maps to find out where they're going to catch their tuna or where they're going to catch their swordfish or whatever. Exactly, it mixes on. the fresh and the salt water. Right. You know, all the yeah. This is it's, how it's, about how about some of the vertical movement? Because you also have a, the same principle goes not just horizontally in the oceans but right. vertically. Right. So, and indeed, on small islands, that becomes very important because salt water is actually heavier, denser than fresh water, and so if you in a in a big open ocean, they'll tend to mix pretty well. But basically, you know, if it's at all constrained, fresh water will tend to float on top of salt water. Right. And so on small, porous atoll islands, basically, what you have is a fresh water lens that sits above the salt water that's infused under the whole island. Mm. And, and it's that fresh water lens often that, that is critical for, well, it's critical for the plants that grow there and, and for people. Uh, so you can who, tap into that yeah. in the survival situation. Right, too. yeah. Uh, I learned something there. I didn't know. That, I mean, it makes sense that they're, it's not disturbed and stabilized in the layers. Right. Of course, nowadays you're getting the, as the oceans, uh, sea levels rising, and you get more yeah. and more wash over that, yeah. that freshwater land. Sometimes gets salinated a bit. Yeah. By, by that. In fact, I just read something this week that was on the on the, the internet that talked about why are the oceans salty and the and lakes aren't, and the whole idea was the the salt minerals that that make the ocean salty start with fresh water moving towards the ocean and depositing, but it doesn't go the other way. Exactly. The, the water doesn't flow uphill. <laughs> right. So right. it brings the, the, the salts from the minerals in the earth into the ocean, right. whereas the rain that falls on the earth originally has no salt in it, and it, it doesn't absorb the minerals right. until it starts moving. It, exactly. That, yeah, that gets us back in the whole water cycle thing. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not always widely appreciated. That Essentially, the water that's around here now is water that's basically been on this planet forever and a day. You know? mm -hmm. they're, they're not really making more water on the, on the planet. We're, we're just recycling the water in. It evaporates out of the ocean, mm -hmm. but of course when it evaporates, it's only the water molecules that evaporate and they leave the salt behind, which is why the salt gradually has increased over uh -huh. eons and eons in the ocean. And then it recondenses, falls somewhere else, you know, eventually gets back into the ground, into a stream, into a river, and comes back to the ocean again. Well, when it comes to how much moisture, how much water is actually in the air, you know, how does that relate to clouds and things like that and temperature? Different temperature ranges will have certain effects on how much moisture is in the air. Can you kind of explain a little bit of that? Right. So, uh, in general, uh, warmer air can hold more moisture, can be Got more it. humid. That's why in particular temperate climates, you notice in winter the air gets very, very dry. Right. The cold air just can't hold the moisture and it falls out and then you try to breathe it and you're get all raspy and all. Uh -huh. uh, but then, it, of course, as, as air rises and gets up to a certain level, it starts Pools getting cool, down. and therefore the water typically comes, condenses back out of it at some point, often in the form of clouds, right? Uh, if there's any particulates for the water, mm -hmm. individual water molecules to start condensing around. Uh, and that's where... So, so here in Hawaii, we kind of have uh, trade winds, hopefully most of the year anyway, right. from the high pressure in the north. And you have clouds, usually around 2,500 feet, maybe 4,000 feet in that mm -hmm. range. And we have mountains here that are 4,000 feet-ish, right. uh, at least on Kauai, Oahu, and, and even taller on the Big Island mm -hmm. is 1,400, 14,000 feet. Right. So as those clouds get pushed along and they hit the landmass and start going up the hill, that explains why you have windward showers more, more often than leeward showers. Exactly, as, as they cool, the, the air, the water has to fall out of the air, basically. Because it's getting pushed into colder air. Right, yeah, and so, uh -huh. and it's actually, we're very fortunate here that we have just sort of the right height, so we, we can get a little of that moisture it does come over the tops of the mountains mm -hmm. and gets on this side of the island, and we're not totally dry here. Uh, we're not a desert, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I was able to visit the Big Island a little bit earlier this year, and went to one of the uh, schools, the charter schools, that, that kind of specializes in uh, doing hands-on projects. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I never thought about, and it amazed me, this charter school is over at Nelha, so West Hawaii uh, National uh, Energy Exchange Laboratory. School. It's at, it's at yeah. Nelha, the National right. Energy Lab there. And the kids had a strawberry patch, and they had a couple experiments going on. Number one, they used the cool ocean water to, to cool the soil, which changed the growing 
cycle of the plant itself. Mm -hmm. And then what amazed me was that same cold water, they ran it through a smaller black tube in spirals, and the outside moisture was condensing on the cold mm -hmm. tube cool. and watering the strawberries. So they didn't have to water the strawberries. They literally had cold ocean water, salt water being run through a tube and exchanging heat, bringing the moisture out of the, out of the atmosphere. Right and dripping the water on the strawberries oh. and kept them watered. And Very I was just blown away. I mean, yeah. yeah, they had to get the cold water out of the ocean right. and bring it up to the, the school, but it was literally taking cold salt water and turning it into fresh, clean water for the strawberries. And I just, that, yeah. that kind of started getting my head going. And no, that's a beautiful that's system, discussion. Right. Yeah. Right, it's, 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 a, it's a very nice way to, to pull the water out of the air just by a temperature difference there, right? Right. right. Which gets back. So, uh, and for places like Hawaii, and like you say, around the equator, you, you probably have a lot more humidity, generally speaking, mm -hmm. available to you to do things like that, where, mm -hmm. again, using either ocean cool temperatures or just temperature differentials, you know, from night to day, um, get moisture out of the air. And there was a, another thing that I heard, this was back when I was in college, a couple, two, three years ago, um, where they were talking about collecting dew from the, the needles and leaves of trees, because mm -hmm. at night it gets colder and colder up, up, and the clouds moving over, depositing the moisture on the trees, and that if you could collect that, you could actually also gather a whole bunch of water. Right, there are even in some places in Chile, for instance, they, they actually set up what they call dew fences, which mm -hmm. are actually set up purposely to collect, to, to collect the dew and, and drain it down to a single source. So even in a fairly dry area, like the mountains uh, mm -hmm. in certain sections of Chile, they can actually collect the water out of the air and it's, it's a valuable source. Wow. And it's been estimated, yeah, that the condensation on plants and all is a, is a real major contributor to the, the soil moisture and the, essentially replenishing the aquifers here in Hawaii. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a really critical aspect again. Are there any other really, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, Trying to think of some of the other aspects of, of how water carries energy. I mean, other than getting into another discussion on hydrogen, which would <laughs> call me hijacking the show. <laughs> but because I, I could go on with that forever, but what are some of the other ways that we maybe don't appreciate water? Well, I mean, again, water, water is, it really does have these amazing uh, different phenomena. It's truly, truly a, a, a very special substance in its properties. And, it's one of the few which does not consistently shrink as it gets colder, right? Mm. It, it does shrink down to about four degrees centigrade, and then it begins to actually expand again a, as it gets locked into these patterns where the hydrogen bonds actually push the molecules a little further apart. And that's why ice, of course, floats. Mm. If ice didn't float, again, this planet would be just that's a radically true. different place. The ice would typically sink in a, in a traditional mindset, and then the oceans would freeze from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. and you would end up with a thin layer of cold water on the planet. Wow. Yeah. yeah and, and we here in Hawaii, I grew up in Hawaii, so mm -hmm. I kind of missed out on some of the things on the mainland, but coming back to the time I did spend on the mainland, there's some pretty cool stuff that happens at really cold temperatures with water too. Like, for example, we're kind of spoiled here with our roads. Mm -hmm. On the mainland, you get water into your road system and it starts to get frozen at night Mm -hmm. The road gets slick, and it also can crack the roads. Right. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, many cultures that live in a real cold climate would actually take to that uh, take advantage of that by cutting grooves into rocks, or drilling holes into rocks with mandrels and things, filling them with water, knowing it would freeze, and the the frozen water would actually crack apart huge boulders into things they could turn around and use for houses or walls and things like that. Right. Right. So I, I, I'd heard of that. It's and, yeah. And again, that's, again, energy, mm -hmm. you know, taking that um, first law of, of thermodynamics, which is energy is neither created or destroyed, it just changes form. Right. And using water as the tool to help it change form. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But then, it, you know, you also get all kinds of, you know, other uh, applications now that they're, they're doing with solar distillation being an increasingly important, I think, mm -hmm. uh, technology that's that's coming of age now. I mean, the, the principles of solar distillation are very simple, right? And people have used them for eons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, it's just it's the water cycle writ small, right? You know, mm -hmm. Instead of evaporating out of the ocean and going up in the air, you, you put all this in a bottle, basically. It. Yeah, and, 
and okay. you just have to have to evaporate and go recondense. And what, no matter what your source is of water is, the water that comes off is pure and clean. Great. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with Dr. Ethan Allen and talk a little bit about distillation. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m. here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to come visit with us on Cannabis Chronicles, a 10,000 year odyssey, where we explore and examine the plant that the muse has given us. And stay with us as we explore all of the facets of this planet on Wednesdays at noon. Please join us. Aloha. Hey, welcome back to Stand the Energy Man on Think Tech Hawaii. On my lunch hour, as all good state employees would never use their company time to have a show like this. So I take this uh, opportunity on my Friday lunch hour to uh, talk energy, which is one of my favorite things. And I've got uh, one of my other hosts here on Think Tech Hawaii who's also into energy, much smarter than me, much more technically <laughs> capable than me, uh, to talk a little bit about water. And we've been talking about some of the principles of how water is such a great medium for moving energy or, or letting it be the mover of energy around the planet in many forms, whether it's currents or whether it's uh, evaporation, going up and making clouds, turning it into rain, and how important water is for us. But it's also, he brought some slides along to talk about a process that we've known for thousands and thousands of years called distillation. And most of us know that you can boil water and make it into steam and get distilled water, but that's not the only way distillation works, and, and you can do it on a fairly small scale. So, right. I'll let you. I'll let you be the professional at this. Explain <laughs> it so I don't screw it up. Sure. So the first slide uh, just shows that actually on top is another interesting property of getting back to your energy idea. The fact that basically, if you need to clean your water, all you really have to do is put it in a bottle and lay that out in the sun, and <clears throat> a day of good. Hot sunlight will basically kill everything in your in your bottle, oh, okay. and, and will really clean up. Uh, Good survival tool yeah, to know. Yeah, but in the bottom half of that is is a, a classic sort of emergency solar still that you can build. Up. You dig a hole in the ground, put a sheet of plastic over it, drop a stone in the middle to make a, a, a point over a capture bucket or a, a jar Some or whatever. Container, yeah. And the moisture in the ground, or you can add you know leaves or whatever, will then evaporate, condense on the plastic on the sheet, run to the center, and drip down in the middle. And again, it's not going to give you a ton of water, but it, it may be the different, difference between life and death, right, if you're right. stuck in a place. But the temperature doesn't get that high in that solar water still, so can you explain why you don't have to actually be boiling water to get that? Well, because water always evaporates, you know, even, even if it's very, very cold, and, and ice actually, it's called sublimation, the mm -hmm, sure. water molecules actually vaporize off the surface of the, of the ice. Because water, each water molecule contains a certain amount of energy, and if it gets any extra energy in it, it's basically able to leave uh, whatever its reservoir is. The water, is, the ice, yeah. and, the solid form and the liquid right. form. Right, and so water seeping out from the soil there or, or uh, in the leaves will be constantly evaporating, and okay. that's all you really want is for it to evaporate, and then you set up a temperature. So, so that makes difference. sense because you got water, which is a molecule, mm -hmm. and it has a boiling point, and it has a freezing point, mm -hmm. and it has a point where it turns into a gas. Mm -hmm. So whether you got water, which is the liquid, or ice, which is the solid form, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of changing the temperature right. to get it to convert into the gas. Uh, individual molecules, at right. At the molecular yeah, level. Right, and so yeah, it doesn't. Okay, it, so yeah. you don't have to boil right. a whole thing of water to get Right. Evaporation. No, I mean, evaporation is happening all the time, right? That's it's why our skin is actually cooler than the right. insides of our body. Cause we're always sort of sweating, putting out a little bit of water that's evaporating and keeping us cool. Yeah, we had um, an electrical engineer from Burns and McDonald. We have him on the third, third Friday of every month on the show, and we talked about air conditioning one time. Mm -hmm. And both of us were woefully lacking in the technical ability <laughs> to talk about how you can 
have heat exchanged um, and and get like if you use ammonia for a refrigerant, mm -hmm. um, get temperature to get colder mm -hmm. using an air conditioning type cycle. Sure. But so, it's it's an amazing process. I, I mean, I used to work in a little metal hut for a while that they mm -hmm. basically set up hoses on the top of it. And when it was hot out, they would just run the hoses. The water would run down over the surface, uh, the metal roof, and basically would be evaporating, keeping the insides of the building cooler. You know, okay, it wasn't terribly efficient. Uh, wasted a lot of water. If but, you have but, extra water, yeah, no yeah problem. This was in Oregon. We had plenty of water. But to get back to the solar distillation, I mean, the problem has always been that solar stills are inherently, well, not inherently, but solar stills have been typically fairly inefficient, only 30 to 40 percent efficient. Mm -hmm. so the next slide, I think, um, shows uh, the, the basics of one kind of solar still. These are some kids actually in Majra are building this. So that will eventually have a outer plastic cover on it. Uh, you'll put salt water in those black plastic bins and the, the, it will then condense on the outer plastic, clear plastic cover and run down and collect in the bottom. On the sides. Right. Okay. But, but as with most still designs, what's happening there is you're, you're heating up a lot of water. You're leaving a, a body of salt water in the sun. And so there's a lot of energy going into just heating that water. And again, as we talked about earlier, water has tremendous heat capacity. So mm -hmm. it's sort of, it's wasting a lot of that energy. Um, some folks recently have sort of trickily overcome that step, and the next slide I think will show. This is a group uh, from a group called Sunny Clean Water, and this still, which is about a, a one square yard footprint there, and about six feet high, five feet high, uh, floats in the water, which is great because you don't, that way you're not having to haul water to your still, the still's actually floating in it. But because that black section in the middle is basically a black absorb, absorbing, absorptive cloth over a styrofoam blocks, basically, uh, the only thing that's being heated up there is the water that's, that's actually being sucked up or, or brought up by capillary action, I should say, on that cloth. So this still actually runs very close to 100% efficiency. So a little one square yard still like that can produce five to 10 gallons of fresh water per day. Wow. Uh, uh, even in a place like Buffalo, New York, where they're developing so in, this. In terms of design, that that thing has a, literally a porous black cloth in the middle. That's what's in the middle. Right. It's, so it's, potentially you could have salt water underneath. Yep, you can float it in a little and, room, right? and because the capillary action of the cloth absorbing w the water, salt water, mm -hmm. but the evaporation is only fresh water, right. hits the top, and then, right. and then collects on the side in little channels. Right. Or you can, again, you can float it in a, in a sewage pond or whatever and be generating fresh, clean Distilled water. Distilled water. Of you know, yeah. Uh, the issues, and actually they're just testing this, and we're, we're going to try to get a unit here in Hawaii and, and also put one up in Majuro, uh, is they haven't really done a lot of testing in salt water yet with it. And they don't know how fast salts will accumulate on that Yeah, on that so you have cloth. to change the cloth. And you may have to change the cloth, yeah, at some point. Uh, okay. But uh, it, it's, it, again, a nice intriguing technology that, they're, that mm -hmm. people are working on. What, what are some of the um, potential, like you're doing it in Majro for a reason, obviously. What are, what are, what's the, the potential value for a small island nation like that, especially a, a dry island, a low island, um, to have a technology like that? Yeah. Do they import a lot of water? Do they have to run this uh, water desalinization plant? Or? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, it's the classic issue now on, on atoll islands is and they do in some places try to run big reverse osmosis plants right. and things, but those are fairly you know, technically complex operations, as right. you doubtless know, and require well-trained yeah. you know, well people yeah. to maintain them and all that. Yeah. A solar, <laughs> passive solar still, by contrast, just runs itself and doesn't really require any real technical expertise. I didn't see a whole lot of moving parts in that. Right. <laughs> there. right. Um, <clears throat> they actually do have a little solar panel and a little pump to, so you can pump sure, the can water off. It. But, yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, so that's pretty efficient. Yeah. Uh, but the yeah the problem with big RO systems is they're very hard to maintain. Although um, there's a group now called Sustainable Ocean Systems who are working on a ship built a ship based RO system that you can mm -hmm. go and park it yeah park it off of a disaster area or whatever, be sucking up deep ocean water and producing you know mm -hmm. a million gallons a day of fresh water wow. for for uh, emergency situations. So perfect uh, yeah. Are there a lot of big companies working on those kind of things? There are more and more because there's a bunch of interesting technologies that are all sort of coming together right now. Um, the, the, the filters have always been a big issue in, in the RO systems, right? Mm -hmm. to, to make a filter that's thin enough but strong enough and has the right size pores to let just water through and nothing else. Um, 
And now with uh, substances like graphene, right. you, know, you, know, you can make atom thick kind of. Yeah, yeah, line. exactly. Filters that are really only yeah, a few atoms thick, and then you need much lower pressure to move the water through them, and so the right. system becomes much more energy efficient. Right. And then the other thing, uh, sort of on an even weirder line, is, is this stuff called uh, uh, radiative photonics, where there are substances which basically reflect, they take in energy, solar energy from a broad band, collapse into a narrow band, which is which the atmosphere is transparent, and radiate it back out and sort of dump it out into space. And therefore, the substance actually cools in the sunlight. Mm. So it sort of seems like it's breaking all the That's, laws of physics. Yeah, really. But you actually measure the temperature of these things, and they're, they're several degrees cooler than the surrounding air. Mm. Uh, so it has great potential for uh, just direct cooling, but you can also you could envision using it to m make water then condense, mm -hmm. using it sort of in what we were talking you were talking about earlier with as a, the, the sort of dew fence, right? Uh, you know. So yeah, all kinds of interesting well, stuff. I know that in the hydrogen world, uh, you knew I was going to eventually hijack this. <laughs> Absolutely. Thing, but there there's some stuff going on now that they're trying to do basically photosynthesis directly from sunlight into breaking down water into hydrogen and oxygen. Yes. And that's kind of intriguing. Do you, do you kind of have a feel for how that how that process would work? That, that's been a, a dream for yeah, it's you like, know, probably a century or two now yeah. of scientists. It's how can we do what every green plant on this planet does? And the plants don't do it very efficiently, right? They're only 5 or 10% efficient, but that's plenty you to get. get enough of them. Yeah, right. And yeah, now they've, they've had some interesting breakthroughs in the past few years, and they're, they're making, they're now developing artificial photosynthesis systems that are, are going to probably in the next few years begin to be really interesting in terms of their efficiencies and their abilities to actually produce uh, usable hydrogen and oxygen out of uh, water. You know. so, so it seems like we're learning from Mother Nature how to be more sustainable by mimicking her processes. Yeah, yes. Uh, biomimicry has been actually a, a very hot topic among the material scientists for the, the past few decades. They have more and more realized that nature has solved a lot of very complex problems in, in very ingenious ways. Mm -hmm. And so in everything from looking at, you know, how is it that, that mussels and other bivalves stick to ocean, to rocks on the shore? They heat up, they dry out, they get immersed in water, they get pounded by waves. What they kind of adhesive there. are they using, yeah. you know? Wouldn't that yeah. be great to have a, have a can of that when your boat starts leaking, you know? Exactly. <laughs> so uh, they do that, and the, the, again, the, the mussel shells themselves are, are amazing constructions. They're incredibly tough, incredibly strong self-healing, you know, all, all kinds of interesting uh, properties to them. Well, it seems to me like um, the key to, to, to humanity is to keep on learning and keep on going. And that's, that's uh, you know, meeting those challenges, challenging ourselves, challenging our science, uh, challenging our scientists and our, our professors to keep us open to new ideas and how to look at things, how to make things happen. And it's going to help us probably learn more about what we already should know from nature. Exactly, but the better understanding, and then if we, yeah. if we can use a little bit of wisdom and common sense and apply it well, uh, we, we, can, we can do well. All right, well, there's our challenge. We gotta keep going and, uh, and let, uh, let's keep learning and keep doing. All right. Thanks, Dr. Allen, for being on the show today, and oh. thanks to everyone for joining us here on Think Tech Hawaii and Stan Energy Man, and we'll be back next Friday. Aloha. <laughs>